Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on change management. Myself, Chris Krause in product management, and Rick Thorne, as I like to call Dr. Worksoft, is here. Rick owns all of our best practices and our education services. Um, we're going to talk about how we deal with change management. Um, we'll give you a perspective on how the industry is changing, the challenges, and then we'll go over specifics of how do we manage those with Worksoft, and we're going to do best practices around that, and we've got some resources at the end. Change is the only constant, of course. We know that everybody's moving from very static to dynamic processes, and their user interfaces are doing the same thing. Um, traditionally, you a mainframe or SAP GUI, you entered a page and went to the next page. These days, things dynamically pop up in the web UI, so the user experience is changing. And people are definitely moving from Agile and to Agile and DevOps. I mean, customers are traditionally waterfall, but we find they really are looking at how can they deliver faster, and they break down the work in the Agile methodology, along with actually deploying. And, and DevOps isn't just code, it's DevSecOps, it's security, it's operations, all those changes happening in the environment. And the other thing is we do find people are trying to accelerate releases. So when people are using success factors, hybrid, SAP, say order management, things like that, they are actually moving more towards an Agile release because they want to do smaller releases more often to put those things out there. So um, if you were at our user conference, um, Shob um, kicked it off talking about change is, uh, the new change management is change orchestration. We really do find that changes are no longer centrally controlled. You've got pipeline changes, which is code. You've got security changes, you know, Patch Tuesday, Microsoft Defender updates. You've got firewalls and databases. Everything in the environment is changing because it's either being upgraded on-premise or in the cloud. And so changes pass through security gates quite easily, but the trick is they need to pass, go past testing gates. How do we think about testing for all these changes when a lot of things are outside of, say, our release cycles themselves? And so we do find that continuous testing is critical to keep the key business processes active. And this is something that, like Rick taught me when I started at Workbus, he's like, our major validation with our customers is we are concerned with end-to-end -end testing of the business processes that keep you running versus unit testing. That's the value and the magic of Workbus, right? And then we do find that testing cycles are mirroring the pace of change. People, say, three years ago did quarterly testing, then moved to monthly to weekly, and now they actually, in earnest, trying to get full regressions on a daily basis. You know, QA is the mission-critical effort that ensures the systems remain up and running. So what do I mean by that, like software updates? Well, if you look at something like Concur, Concur has multiple releases. You know, they have quarter releases and then other releases on top of that. So, you know, it, it seems innocuous because it's a cloud-hosted application. Am I doing that much? Well, yeah, but the applications are changing, your connectivity, your firewalls, your databases are changing. But really what acts, exacerbates that is no one's workflow is a single application. Everybody goes across multiple applications. A very common thing we hear with our customers is not every transaction starts in SAP, but it certainly crosses it along the way, right? So if you think about Concur, you've got SAP, you've got SuccessFactory, you've got Salesforce, Manhattan, Ariba, like our business processes cross all those applications from the end-to-end -end perspective, and there's multiple releases. So it's quite honestly possible you can have a major release of any of these softwares every month of the year or every two weeks of the year. So just because you're looking at one application doesn't mean that upstream and downstream aren't changing on a very regular basis. Just an example, did you know that SuccessFactors had four major releases? We had five scheduled for HANA, 12 for Concur, and three plus for Salesforce. And these are the ones that they're telling us about that are functional changes. Really, there can be other changes outside of that. You know, it could be the rehosting data centers and moving things in the background that we just don't know about, right? So if we break it down, we're, there's three types of changes that we have. So there's data, there's actual processes, or we are like changing the way we're doing our business, and then the screens, what you see and you don't see. So we think of this as a triangle. And testability, test stability, stable testing, I should say, because I can't say stability, um, is how we get there, right? So what are the things that break these tests? Well, could it be changes in the screen? I've dynamically changed the HTML. 
Am I, am I adding a new process or do I have data? Because everybody knows test data is a challenge, right? So let's start with screens. So quite honestly, um, I talked to say Brian Smith, our VP of um, Research and Development. I said, you know, we've gotten a little bit lax because SAP GUI is so ultra stable. Your physical names are ultra stable. Test screens don't change. You know, we upgrade SAP GUI, we upgrade ECC with service packs and that. And they just don't break because our UIs are exceptionally stable because of the way they were written. Now, on the other side, web apps are the wild, wild west of instability, right? It is really difficult to keep up with that. And it's not just that the screens are changing, say you're changing from Blue Crystal to Belize in the HTML. The hard thing is the things behind the scenes. Believe it or not, you know, Salesforce and these large package apps, they actually look at how can I optimize the data going to and from the browser and the background. So they'll make updates behind the screen that you don't notice that's actually purely the site bandwidth of the network itself. Um, but so if we look at a web application, like what are the things that change there? Because this is, the, my premise is, you know what, we no longer sit on top of stable screens. But we've turned the triangle a little bit sideways and saying there's nothing stable in the environment. The screens are changing, the data is changing, the process is changing. So how do we deal with that if we don't have a stable base? Well, one thing is, you know, how do we manage that? And obviously web extensibility is how we do that for you in Workshop. But what causes this? Is it there's fields are moving on the screen, JavaScript libraries, we call them like UI5, we're getting optimized and we're doing a better job of rendering data and sending data. Sometimes it's um, we have new journeys in Agile because we're building stories to features over quarterly increments. So our processes are constantly changing. And then the, um, we, the data is built out and configured as we change those applications themselves. So an example is, let's look at Fiori. You can see um, from the traditional 1610 screen, you've got sales orders and you click a pop-up. But what you don't see is what's happening in the background. Um, our fields showing up and hiding and changing that. Um, now, if I go to 1809, what happens is the change, we have even more changes. So if I look at the list, they're now multi-select. So this is going from like blue crystal to Belize and back and forth, right? The look and feel changing. There's new human factors here. Before you could click one row, it would give you a pop-up. Um, you could drill into one row. Now we have check boxes and the select all button. And obviously they're making this so it would work on a mobile device or a touch screen, you know. Um, and notice the pop-ups changed. The data on the screen is changed. We now have the titles in different places, an icon. So if we're doing test validation and we're clicking into an item, at one point it was a click, now it's like a selection and a click, right? So the screens are changing a lot. So just to put some metrics on that, if you look at the total number of definitions of the different objects, like things that could be rendered um, in s -Rahana. in 1511, there was 51, in 1610, 283, in 1809, 378. So they are dramatically changing the way we're looking at the user interfaces. They're giving us more ways to visualize data. And then what happens is they nest them inside of each other. So the growth of you know, better presentation or user experience in these web apps is really causing instability. And how do we test these applications? The next one is data changes. Um, I'm going to handshake over to Rick to talk about these. Thanks, Chris. Uh, you know, when we were talking together at transform our user conference this spring, we put up this slide and I asked everybody if, if they agreed with this assertion that more than 50% of our automated tests uh, failures are caused by incorrect missing or out of date data. The audience overwhelmingly not only agreed with it, but some suggested that it may be too low, yeah. that it was more approaching 70%. That means that you have a huge opportunity in order to make sure that your tests are more stable just by doing something to correct the way you handle data in a more automated fashion. So what we're talking about in the next slide is how to do that. First of all, when you want to manually in the old, you know, kind of domain, uh, change your data because something failed, you go to the business, right? And you'd say, well, how do I, what do I do? I gotta, I gotta, I gotta have new data and they would, 
take it, would, it was hard to get a hold of them. They're busy, and then and they're not really delighted that we keep coming back and asking them that same question every time we run our tests. They're busy running the business, right? <laughs> and so it takes significant amount of time from them, and also takes significant amount of time for the automation team themselves. However, we're going to show you ways where you can reduce that that interdependency down close to zero and at the same time reduce those failures down close to zero. So how do you deal with data changes? First of all, you got to have a plan, right? Failure to plan is planning to fail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So we, we have to figure out what kinds of data we're dealing with and what we're going to do in order to make sure that it doesn't fail for us. And we'll get into some details about data preparation and data cleanup in just a minute. But first, I want to talk about the plan just for a second, because one of the things that we find uh, happens over and over again in complex global operations um, that are using tools like SAP and Salesforce and the different success factors concur, those things that Chris was talking about, is that you have multiple environments that you're testing in. So part of what is causing a failure is I'm pointing to the wrong environment. I'm running the test that I ran yesterday, which was pointing to dev, but today I'm trying to test in free fry, and I forgot to change my login, that kind of stuff. So I, planning when and where and how those tests are going to be executed so that I can put in the correct login information and the correct data then sets that are present in those separate uh, environments is critical. So I may have actually separate data. I may have different master data, different transactional data that is appropriate to test in pre-prod versus dev. So I, may, I need to make sure I'm pointing to the correct data as well. So that's all. That's planning. That's, that's not just making sure that the data was accurate in the system. That's now making sure that I'm actually feeding the correct data in the first place and in the correct system. So uh, the key for the, the next two uh, elements, test data preparation and test data cleanup, is to avoid that manual intervention that we talked about a minute ago. Uh, uh, you know, Chris is always uh, telling us that we need to drink our own champagne. And yet, we went, we went and introduced a, a change process that requires you to do manual things. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is figure out, well, how do we, how do we automate some of those? Well, the first one with, with test data management is go capture, go use capture from WorkSoft to record, if you will, what your business users are doing in order to help you correct the data. Now you've got an automated process, a robotic process, if you will, that you can embed within your test. So if I'm, I'm not necessarily testing, when I'm doing a test of delivery, I'm not testing whether or not uh, there's adequate stock or whether or not I can replenish stock. And yet, if I put that subset or subtest into my automation, it will prevent my delivery from failing just because I don't have adequate amounts of stock on hand. So let's automate some of those things. So uh, this, is, this is a way of starting the process or the discussion about avoiding false failures and missing data. I call them false failures because when you get a failure report from running a bed of regression tests, the first thing you want to know is what's the percentage of failures that I have. And if 70% of those failures were just data, that's not a failure in the, in the business process, which is what we're trying to validate. It's, it's a failure in the test. So we, that eliminating those gives you a much truer picture of what your failures are in the business process validation that you're trying to do. So let's verify the data availability or create that needed data as part of the automation, as we talked about a minute ago. Next slide, please. Oh, there you did. Thank you. They look the same to me. <laughs> so data, data cleanup is the next major bullet in, in this discussion, and that has to do with uh, uh, the fact that we tend to bloat our SAP and other databases with test data that we no longer need or use. So one example is we traditionally test in silos, and the guys that are testing order creation once they're done testing order creation, then they hand the process over to the people that want to test order delivery, right? And the first thing they say is, well, give me 100 new sales orders so I can test the delivery against those, right? And they use maybe 50 of them and test the delivery, and then they're happy and they're done. And now we've got 
50 sales orders sitting out there nobody's ever going to use, just clogging up the database. Um, the same thing happens when you're testing metadata, metadata, master data. Master data, when I'm trying to make sure that the business process for creating new master data is working properly, I'm creating new master data, but it's bogus data. It's not data that I'm going to use later on for testing, so why don't we clean that up? Let's back that back out again and avoid people being confused by data that isn't valid and trying to use that in their transactional testing. It just cleans everything clean and, and, and better. So uh, Chris talked about the types of change, but where do those changes come from? Um, they come from sometimes from new regulations. Um, you know, the most common one that everybody's starting to struggle with today is the, is the general data protection regulations, right, that now have worked their way across the pond and that we as, as globally aware companies, even if we're not globally present, are starting to have to deal with individually. That's causing us to make changes in the way we handle data, which is our business processes. So we have to validate those changes. New regulations make business process changes happen that we then have to adapt our tests to accommodate. M&A activity, so your companies are changing by mergers and acquisitions and sales. And whenever that happens, the new organizations being brought into the fold are often adopting new processes and you need to help them understand how the new business processes work and then test whether or not they're working well for their part of the business, which is different than the part of the business that they were designed for in the first place. And then maybe tweaks have to be made, which means tweaks have to be made to your changes in your testing as well and in order to keep up with that. And thirdly, market conditions. You know, we have uh, the, the, uh, the customer's appetite for a particular type of product went away and was replaced by a different one that causes a different change in the manufacturing process. I've got to make sure that that's working correctly when I validate through testing. All of those things um, uh, uh, lead to having to make continuous changes to tests. So what are the things that they cause in the application? New and different fields, old and obsolete fields. So you're going to remove some steps that are no longer are there anymore. You're going to have to add some steps for new things that need to be done. You've got applications constantly being customized. And, and I'm not talking about just the customizations you're doing to SAP, but you've got your own custom apps that you've built for specific areas of your business. Those are constantly being changed by your own IT department as well. You have expanding workflows. And so we talk about M&A activities changing or regulations making changes. As those things happen, you have to be agile enough to change those. And people are moving to a more agile uh, way of building on those workflows, not just in, in, in development of software, but now in the changes that are being applied, not just to the software, but to the business processes and therefore to the tests as well. So adopting that agile isn't just in the, uh, in the development anymore. It's now in the continuous testing of what's going on. So uh, those net new workflows need to be uh, 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 validated and tested as part of your business process as well. When you do that, you make those changes, if you have a lot of simple tests, it's pretty easy to go and find where I need to make those changes, especially if you're following the best practice of reusing component tests, right? In other words, I am executing the same child test in multiple parents I have multiple versions of sales orders, but the sales order entry screen is essentially the same. It's just different data. So that test can be reused rather than copied and have to be maintained multiple times. So if you have lots of simple tests, the way Certify is designed and the way you follow those best practices, you make that change one time and all of those new process flows that inherited that subtest now have been changed for you. It's really simple to do. On the, on the other hand, if you have built very complex logic, that says if this happens, then I go here, but if that happens, then I go there. More than, more than about three of those get you into trouble. And now you're testing the test rather than trying to figure out if my business process works. So I, I basically just talked about all this, but uh, uh, the other thing at the bottom there, simple versus complex data sets. Um, when you have a lot of different organizations, maybe you got 10,000 storefront locations uh, across, around the world, you need to test the individual storefronts are slightly different in terms of the data that they use. 10,000 record sets is a lot to maintain. 
but we remember the filter and skip character capabilities inside of Certified allow you to have maybe one 10,000 row record set where you can filter out which rows of that record set you're using for each storefront by identifying the storefront number uh, for each one and it makes it much simpler even to maintain the data. So don't forget uh, as we make all those changes that there's and that's the kind of the core concept of this whole discussion from the beginning is how do we manage those changes to the test to make sure that we're not you know uh, uh, causing problems on our own, you know, shooting our own foot <laughs> by making a change inappropriately. So, so traditionally what we've taught you to do is to, to have a gold copy of the test and that's bounded by security so that people can't go in and accidentally make changes to it. So in order to make a change to a test that's already in that gold copy, what you've got to do is copy that from gold copy down into a, a development folder, a development sandbox, if you will. When you copy it though, then you have to go, oh, wait a minute, that's an end-to-end -end test. There are several children that it calls. I need to now copy those children that are affected by that change and make sure that they are also in my development folder. Oh, wait a minute. Each of those children and the parent have record sets associated with those. I better copy those down too in case I need to change data. Now when you're done, you've got to remember to move all of those back into the gold copy in the right way after they've been validated by your peer review and other QA on your QA that you do. Um, that's a very complex manual error prone, prone process. Back to Chris's suggestion that we drink our own champagne. How about if I give you, he says, some automation to the automation to the way you're changing your automation? And that's what these new products that were introduced last year and this year allow us to do and collectively they give us a way of handling the change management that is much more automated and much less manual intervention and that grabs all those relationships for you and follows them for you all the way down into where you're making changes and back up again and what chris is going to show you is how those pieces work chris yep so these are definitely new features within the product around should you think about having a development database or a physical database and your application definitions are changing a lot or do you version your application? Those things are available. We'll talk about process comparing, process versioning, and most importantly, like importing and exporting merging themselves. So one thing we found is when people have very distributed teams, it's okay to have a second database. They may have geographically located there, and then they can actually have a version of the database. This is for you know next month's version of success factors. And we have our current database is what our current regressions are. We'll, we'll make it easier to move and migrate your tests across those databases. Traditionally, people have always tried to keep everything in one because change management wasn't as easy. We've really made that easier, and you'll see that. The next thing is process compare. How can we make it easier to actually see the differences between two uh, processes themselves? So, slide of hand. I've got here a sales order process, and I've got sales order one. I'll just control click. And if I do a right click, I can say compare two processes. So what this does is opens a process comparison dialog. So I can see there's a, this has two sub processes. This one has three. So there's actually a, a, a third process in the version one. So if you're, say, working through change management, you're doing a peer review, this is an easy way to see what's different. I can see here the green check. Okay, it looks like these are literally the same process. Same, same data, right? Maybe this has the same data. Oh no, there's some extra steps here too. So this version had an enter and an extra input that this version doesn't. On the right, I've got new steps over here. So the process compare literally just lets you see what's the difference between two processes. Now, I'm going to compare these order um, sales order one and two. So I do a right click and I'll do compare to the process. Start from the bottom, will those look the same? Okay. Oh, oh, let's see here. Actually, the only difference is changes in data, right? So what you'll see is a pencil means there's an edit, a plus, minus, adding and missing, and then checks are the same. So when we compare processes, we'll be able to see are there actually data differences or are there um, um, 
you know, steps, differences. And then um, one thing we'll see a little bit later is I'm a big fan of using this to decide that people actually variableize the right things because two static values or a static value and a variable, you know, hard-coded data and variables will actually show up as a pencil with the difference between the difference between the processes themselves. So really handy when people are saying doing a code review or peer reviews when you want to move things between environments. So process version. So this is brand new. Um, actually creating a version of a process. So in many cases what I do is I, you know, I use Capture, I get my Gen Doc, and then I handshake to the engineer, and they get my initial version of the process, and then they start variabilizing it and refactoring it and finding useful sub-processes and all those good things. Um, so that's what versioning does. Now it'll also show you how to restore a previous version and actually how to recover or restore a deleted version itself. So here I have this process called find. Okay, if I look, um, I have no versions here. I'm going to do a right click and say um, new version. So create version and say original. This is going to have my original data in it and I'll create. And I did click the create then, right? So they can, oh. Click the wrong version. Click OK, not cancel. There you go. Original version, and I can see the path to it and the date and time, and this is going to be version number one. I'm going to come in here and actually edit this. So, not too surprising. Click Shift, Control Click, click, right click, and I'll say Add to Layout. Very normal. And what will happen in the background, we'll figure out what's there. I'll create a record set with my data. And now I've basically gone through the process of variabilizing my process and I save it. So I close this. Now if someone, say I'm presenting this trick and say, hey, I've gone through and variabilized my processes, you can say, okay, so what changes did you make? Did you take a version before you started changing it? Well, yes, I did. So I'm going to say compare versions to the current. And what we'll do is we'll take the, the snapshot of the old one. Now the trick is this doesn't take the sub-processes, it's just this parent process. And what I can see is there's a variable here, the original one was hard-coded. Variable here, the original one was hard-coded. So this is what makes it very easy to see what changes are there. And in this case, I just simply added some change fields, right? Um, so super handy. I can actually go through and create another version. Create version after variables, right? So I can have as many of these as I want. And then if I actually can select two of these and actually compare these two versions. So I can look at changes that happened in the past to understand what's happened there. Um, now, the other thing is, maybe um, that guy, Chris, just does not know what he's doing and completely screwed up the variableizing. Okay, uh, let's just go back to the original version. If I think, say re restore process, it will actually take and restore a previous version. So if you just, you had a bad Monday and you just messed it completely up, just go back and restore it. So I'll say yes. And then what will happen is I now have my original version back, okay? And, and everyone saw you have a bad Monday and you're like, ah, what was I thinking? Um, why did I do that on Friday? I don't know what I did, right? Completely legitimate. These are things that have grown out of traditional, um, say, versioning that developers think of. It's very Kobe like to do it. Um, but it's good to have. Now, the third thing that this is really good for is when you have a really bad Friday and someone does this. Wah, and wah. They delete your process. <laughs> it's like wah, wah, wah. So, and this happens. People are like, oh, oh, I needed that. So, if we look in the tools, if we look at the change history, what we'll see is two things happen. This process was deleted, but a version of this process was created automatically. So, when you delete a process, in the background, um, our clever developer, Darren, just automatically takes this copy of it for you. So you're like, wow, I actually need this back. You can say restore process. Now, 
he's going to ask you where did this go? Do you want to put it where it was in this process compare or, or in a different area? Okay. I'll go and put it back in my sandbox. And so, yep, let's open it up. There we go. The process is back and we're good to go. So versioning is kind of handy. Um, it'll let you take it. Snapshot. Now think of it as this is just a step. So it doesn't follow to the children the step processes, the data, the record sets, the layouts. It's literally just the process that you're editing. Um, but I think it's very helpful. Take a version, make your edits, and then take a version, and it's easy to compare them. And we do code, code reviews with your peers, and that that's very easy to handle. Now, number four, now this is the most exciting one. It's actually process export import and merging. So this was um, implemented at the end of last year, and then we've definitely iterated and made it better and better um, through this year. And we've actually made some recent changes to the way we're handing record sets. But um, what an export does is it allows you to take a process and easily move it between databases or actually move it between different parts of your existing project. Because an export will actually take the process and any processes it depends on, any children processes, any record sets, all the application versions and everything brings it all together and exports it for you. And then it's up to you. You can import it into a new database. You can import it into your sandbox. You have a nice full replica. And then you can merge it back. So before we started this, Rick talked about some of the complications of if you have an end-in -end process that relies on sub-processes, has record, multiple record sets of data, um, people, when they copy those to their, their sandboxes, sometimes didn't get the children moved. So their sandbox was according to production. Or the worst, you move it back and you forget to get your children relined up, right? And so we'll see how merging does that for us automatically. So over here, what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to come over to like a day in the life. A lot of you have your goal copy and you've got your order to cash process. I'm going to do a right click. I'm going to say um, export this process. Okay, I need to give it a folder, and this is going to say the zip. We'll save it. So what happens is we look at this process, and we go look at all the sub processes it uses. We look at all the record sets it uses, and all the applications. So what I can see here is that here's the layout. There's everything available. I'm going to say show selected. So this order has multiple record sets assorted with this layout, so I can actually see all of them. If I don't want to pull them all, I can uncheck one, or I can pull them all. But the nice thing is this is going to create a representation of this process with all of the data and all the applications and the versions. So as it cranks around, you'll see it says map objects and requirements and attributes and variables and all those good things. I'll say open that up. So if I do, double click, I look at the manifest.txt. Well, what happened? Okay, this order to cache relied on a lot of other processes, right? So it pulled all the sub processes. And I actually see something a little bit concerning. Looks like we did not use merge in the past. Rick is laughing if you can't tell. Um, someone is pointing to their sandbox process. Okay, obviously this is a no-no. And, and and this happens all the time. Yeah, not, not contrived, it's actually in our demo database. <laughs> right? But let's see, we had 11 processes, we had four layouts, we had 34 variables, and then map objects. So all the, think about the changes to the attributes behind buttons and tables and clicks. We've exported everything together, okay? So what this means is now I can actually go pull this into my sandbox and go fix this process. So if I click my name in the sandbox, and say import processes, go browse, sort it, there it is on the top. I'm going to say, I can say match existing layouts, which means my layout and the gold folder would be used, but I'm going to say no, actually create a full replica because that, something's not right. It points to some sandbox stuff. It's a little concerning. <laughs> I need to fix that, right? So this is going to be kind of nice. So what will happen is they've all been brought in. So if I look in my Chris Crow, underneath here, I have an import with the date and the time. Okay? And this is actually a complete replica 
of all the folders that existed above. So this is, think of these are relative paths to each other. Now this is a little concerning. Naughty, naughty, Jill. He's actually pointing to a sandbox in production. But just like you would expect, all the subfolders are there. Now the nice thing is this process, if I open it, these subprocesses it's pointing to are in my sandbox. So we've, they're relative to each other, right? So now, in my case, I know that so Jill's has got this SAT transaction. Uh, this probably belongs here. So let's move that up. Hey, good stuff. Let's, you know, let's, let's delete that. Don't need that. So now, um, because certifies magic. We know that the, when I move those subprocesses, the parents that point to them, it's all magic. It knows where it is. So now, I ordered a cache is actually well formed. Um, and if I want to get that back up over here into the, into the regression test, I don't want to have to go through and move every process individually. So what I want to do is say, from my master process, I want to merge. So merge to other processes. And it's going to say, well, where do you want to merge it? I'm going to say, I'm going to go up to integration, and here's my order to cache. And what's going to happen is it's going to go through and it's going to do all the math. It's going to say, okay, order to cache has 34 different um, applications and maps, and it has variables and it has sub processes and all that. And then the background is going to reconcile those to say, okay, um, if this is my source, and this is actually and my area, and my target is to move it over into the goal copy area. This is what's in the middle. Now, I can just say directly replace the target and I'll look at it. But in some cases, you know, maybe there's a step that you have in test that you don't have in a production. So you can actually choose which size you want them to. But what you'll see here is there's all these warnings. Warning, the folder is a little bit different. So what it is is this step process if all of the other processes are in this folder, it would be one thing. But it's warning me thing. Actually, it's relying on processes in these utilities folders and the SAP folders. So it's, it's just a warning. It's good for me to understand how they're distributed. But the thing is, when I actually save this, it's actually going to go through and do a comparison up and move everything. So what it will do is actually work on reparenting all of the sub-processes to the new parent. So I'll, I won't have any hanging children in the wrong folders themselves. Okay. No more hanging chads. No more hanging chads. So right. what you're telling me is that I don't have to go and figure out, oh, which children got changed, mm -hmm. which record sets, right, which, which layouts, right. Certifies doing all that for me with merge. Yes. Nice. And so and the nice thing is what we literally do. If any if any of you are like naughty and you want to know about these these columns here, right? You know that if you do a right click and then you say customize column, there's a field over here called ID. And this is actually the primary key in the database. What you'll notice is that we will maintain the ID. So basically, we literally in place replace all the code in that child so the parents will know where it is. So we actually do all the right integrity rules. Whereas if I copied it up, you get a new ID. A new ID and now your test could be broken. Yes, that thing could happen. Yes. So yeah. oh, that's that's a, that's a really good thing. Yeah. One other question, Chris. When you're doing all of that, I got I got these pieces, right? I'm versioning, I'm exporting, I'm importing, I'm merging. Let me just level set kind of an order for you yep. and see if this works. Before I do my export, maybe I should take a version of what's in yeah. my gold copy mm -hmm. so that in case if we fail QA or something after it's moved up, something happens, we want to revert, we can. You could roll back. Okay. So first thing to do is take a version, mm -hmm. export what I want to change. When I take the version, by the way, that, that description, I like that because I can say, well, this is the version before the changes I told Chris to make in this yep. evidence. Yep. And, and you could even be as verbose as you want, list all the changes you want to make. Yeah. Cool. Now you take the export and you bring it down into wherever it's being assigned for the changes, mm -hmm. right? So the development folder or sandbox folder for the particular developer that's now responsible for, or automation engineer that's now responsible for making those changes, right? He makes the changes when he's done, goes to peer review. Yep. It gets approved 
for being brought back up, instead of exporting and importing or, or copying and pasting, now you do the merge. Yeah. So that merge needs to be done then by whoever has authority to make changes to gold copy, which should be a very restricted, very highly controlled person. Yes. So then the master. Yeah. Yeah. So we then fully respect security. So you can only you can copy out, but you can't overlay or write into folders that aren't available. So it does really help with um, change management. And we do think that there's going to be a lot more changes. Now, and remember, the one thing is we do carry the application versions also. So if you move this between two databases, we'll pull record set layout data on that, but we'll also go create the apps for you. So, and that's always the hard part. You know, did I get the app out of the right maps? Yep, get the maps all associated there.